Good morning. Welcome to the webinar for the Advanced Reactor Strategy Report. I'm Dean Scott, Senior Environment and Energy Reporter for B-Law. It's part of the Bloomberg family. Um, I note this webinar is being recorded for all of you. I'm going to go over some brief biographical information for some of the participants this morning. And thanks to all of you for joining us. It's, uh, it's a great turnout today. I'm looking forward to a really engaged discussion. First, we'll have Judy Greenwald. Judy is Executive Director of the Nuclear Innovation Alliance. Uh, NIA is a think and do tank focused on commercializing advanced reactors as a climate solution. They provide analysis and recommendations in support of regulatory, legislative, industry, and civil society activities. Ms. Greenwald has over 35 years of energy and environmental policy leadership experience in the public and nonprofit sectors, including the US Congress, White House, EPA, Department of Energy, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, C2ES, which was formerly the Pew Center on Global Climate Change. She is a fellow at Princeton University's Andalinear Center for Energy and the Environment. Ken Longo is the founder and president of the Partnership for Global Security, creator of Global Nexus Initiatives. The Partnership for Global Security focuses work on the policy nexus of climate change, nuclear power, and global security. Ken is a recognized innovator, entrepreneur, and leader in global nuclear and transnational security policy. He served as a senior advisor to the Secretary of Energy for Non-Proliferation Policy and simultaneously at the Department of Energy as the Director of the Office of Arms Control and Non-Proliferation, Director of the Russia and Newly Independent States Nuclear Material Security Task Force, and Director of the North Korea Task Force. He's authored nearly 100 articles, been a TEDx presenter, engaged extensively with global media, and briefed governments and audiences around the world on nuclear and transnational security challenges and responses. We'll also be joined by three respondents who are going to comment on the report from ClearPath, Good Energy Collective, and the Atlantic Council a little later in the program. Uh, we're going to open up the conversation to questions uh, a little later after we have a brief conversation with uh, Judy and Ken. Um, I'm gonna hand this off to Judy and Ken to introduce some of the findings of the report and discuss uh, some of the highlights and sort of the purposes for why we're talking about an advanced nuclear strategy now. I'm gonna hand it off to you. Judy, would you like to start? Thanks so much, Dean, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. I just started as executive director of the Nuclear Innovation Alliance last fall, and I'm really happy to be working with our partners and the broader advanced reactor community on this promising technology. I believe it's essential to pursue a portfolio of options to give us the best chance of success at combating climate change. We developed this strategy to synthesize insights and aspirations from across the advanced reactor community, including from many of you in the audience. We did this together with PGS to combine their international focus with our domestic one. The strategy highlights the important role that advanced nuclear energy can play in achieving domestic and global energy goals, particularly for decarbonization. We believe we need to launch a whole of society effort. That means industry, government, labor, environmentalists, local community leaders, private investors, and others working together. We need to ensure societal benefits with advanced nuclear energy that's affordable, clean, reliable, and just. I'm gonna focus on our domestic recommendations and let Ken focus on the international ones. We recommend incorporating advanced nuclear energy into a broader US climate innovation and infrastructure agenda. This requires actions at all levels of government to create jobs, foster economic growth, promote community development and modernize our energy system. And it requires continuing and in fact growing bipartisan support for allowing all promising low carbon technologies to be part of the solution. The administration has a major role to play through successful implementation of the US Department of Energy Innovation Programs, especially through public-private partnerships. And Congress has a major role to play in ensuring adequate funding. The Independent Nuclear Regulatory Commission must continue its essential role in ensuring safety 
It needs to do so effectively and efficiently in a way that accounts for the characteristics of the new suite of advanced reactor technologies. Industry is leading on innovation and will need to demonstrate it can deliver cost competitive commercial designs. As we pursue advanced reactor development, we need to prioritize community engagement and environmental justice, and we won't be successful unless we do. We hope this report will spur conversation among all the relevant voices to begin making a whole of society effort possible. The largest near-term priority is for the industry to license, develop, and build demonstration projects. And we need sufficient appropriations from Congress, and we also need private investment. Time is of the essence due to the timeframes for developing, designing, license, licensing construction, and cost innovation through learning by doing. And that means that we have to start now. So I'll turn to Ken and see if he wants to talk about the international part. Thanks, Judy, and uh, thanks, uh, Dean. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been my great pleasure to be able to collaborate with NIA on this report and also with the other parties that have endorsed it and that are uh, represented today on today's webinar. What I want to do is focus on five key interrelated international global security issues that are highlighted in the report. First, there's a pressing need to reestablish the role of the United States in, as a leader in nuclear exports. The U.S. can't compete on advanced nuclear products and achieve its goal if it doesn't have a product that the market wants and that it can develop in a reasonable time frame. Without a viable reactor, it will be difficult for the U.S. to ensure the strong nonproliferation and nuclear security standards, which are going to be necessary for the eventual deployment and expansion of advanced nuclear around the world. Two, the next generation of nuclear nonproliferation security guidance needs to be developed and the United States needs to be a central player in that process. The smaller size, the novel coolants and fuel cycles associated with these reactors um, are going to need adjustment in the international security and non and um, safeguard system uh, just because those standards were primarily written for large reactors. So historically, those that are most active, those nations which are most active in the nuclear export business uh, and in the market have had an outsized influence over those standards. So for the United States to continue to support and advance its strong support for nonproliferation and nuclear security, it needs to be a player in the export market. Third, nuclear geopolitics are an important economic, diplomatic, and global security concern. Russia and China are going to be major competitors for the United States and its allies in this reactor space. They will not be waiting for the United States to play catch up. They are already out there engaged with a number of countries, especially in the developing economy world, uh, on the export uh, market and for their technologies and for their energy products especially in China through Belt and Road and then Russia through more general um, energy and geopolitical strategy. So for, for, from my perspective, and I think it's clear in this report, the stakes are not just economic. In other words, the export issue is not just an economic issue, but it's a geopolitical influence and a nonproliferation and security issue as well. Four, financing is an essential issue to achieve US global security and export leadership objectives. The Russian and Chinese nuclear companies are state-owned enterprises, and it's clear that they have an inherent advantage over the United States and allied companies that primarily are private sector. A private sector-centric approach is unlikely to work in the current environment, in the current market environment. There needs to be a partnership between the private sector and governments, and you need to ensure that there's a steady flow of capital for this process. There also needs to be a partnership between the United States and its allies, because not all of, uh, of the supply chain resides within the United States. They should also consider um, collaborating on export financing. And finally, number five, nuclear must be part of clean energy diplomacy. It's not been a top priority in the international climate change strategy up to this point, despite the fact that in the United States, it is over 50% of the clean energy 
uh, clean electricity production in the United States. And that's also true for other countries like in South Korea. Uh, it has been included in the clean energy ministerial process, but nuclear has really not been uh, a piece of the top level discussion under the UN COP process, Conference of the Parties Paris Agreement. Uh, and it's also fighting for a space inside the EU. So there needs to be a change at the upcoming Glasgow meeting on the UN framework agreement. Uh, and I think that uh, the Biden administration has made clear that they view nuclear as part of the clear and clean energy suite of technologies. Uh, and I'm hopeful that they'll be uh, active in, uh, in promoting it uh, in Glasgow as well as domestically. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'd like to each, uh, ask each of you uh, a question sort of to, to frame this for where we are in the climate discussion and intersection with advanced nuclear, which is why should the Biden administration include advanced nuclear as part of its climate strategy, particularly in its ambitious goal to get us to net zero emissions by 2050? Uh, Ken, if you'd like to go first, that'd be great. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, if you look at the documents from the campaign phase of, uh, of the last year, it's clear that nuclear is a component of their strategy. Also, if you look at, you know, the, the challenging political environment inside the United States, advanced nuclear has been one of the few issues on which there's been bipartisan support. So um, I, I think that we, you know, we have a foundation for how this process can advance uh, I think there's a clear space domestically and internationally for this technology, um, but this administration is really going to have to put their foot on the gas and move it forward. And you know, the, the the challenge I think is that the United States doesn't have a great track record of moving important energy technologies beyond the R and D phase, and I don't think we can let that happen. I, the challenge from China and the challenge from Russia is serious. Um, and if you listen to what the president had to say about his call with President Xi, you know, they're going to eat our lunch. Well, we can't allow them to eat our lunch on this issue. This is an important energy issue and clean energy is essential uh, for the globe. So I think that as a, as a matter of prioritization, uh, this administration really needs to press forward and we can't allow what's happened in the past to happen again. And that is we spend billions of dollars through the R&D phase and then we abandon the project. Judy, what, Judy, what's your thought? What are, what are some of your thoughts? Yeah, the, the administration should include advanced nuclear energy because it will make it more likely that we'll succeed in combating climate change. And the, the climate is just too important to bet it on too narrow a set of technologies. And the good news is that the administration, as Ken said, seems to understand that. The administration is approaching the climate problem with ambition and urgency and is taking a technology inclusive approach that includes advanced nuclear energy and lots of other important and promising technologies. And what we hope is that the strategy that we're releasing today will help them to flesh out this component of their agenda. The other thing they seem to understand, and this is what I think Build Back Matter build back better could mean is that we have to take a whole of society approach just as we have to in advanced nuclear, we have to do that for climate more broadly. Uh, solving climate change isn't something that the federal government can do by itself, although federal policy is super important. But the administration needs to lead a national mobilization in which we all have roles to play. And that's what it seems to be, to me, it seems to be that that's where they're headed and we'd really be happy to help. Mm. Thank you, Judy. Um, I'd like to introduce three other you know, respondents, sort of experts in this area, and give them an opportunity to react to your report, also highlight some key takeaways. And uh, I'd also like to take a moment to suggest those who are, are watching today, send us some good questions. We've got some good people on this thing. And uh, I really like this topic, particularly this intersection between the kinds of technologies that we're going to need if the US and for that matter, the world is going to move toward uh, um, reducing all our emissions to, to, to the amount required by science by 2050. First, we have Nico McMurray, Nuclear Program Director at ClearPath. 
NECO develops and advances ClearPath's policies on nuclear energy as part of the organization's broader focus on clean energy innovation. Prior to joining ClearPath, NECO was a materials engineer at the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. ClearPath's mission is to develop and advance policies that accelerate breakthrough innovations that reduce emissions in the energy and industrial sectors. Jessica Levering is co-founder and co-executive director of Good Energy Collective. She's worked in advanced nuclear policy for eight years, recently completed her PhD in engineering and public policy at Carnegie Mellon University. Good Energy Collective is a policy research organization building a progressive case for nuclear energy as an essential part of the broader climate change agenda. And then we'll have Dr. Jennifer Gordon. Jennifer is the managing editor and senior fellow at the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center, where she runs a nuclear energy policy portfolio and focuses on the geopolitics of nuclear energy and international civil nuclear cooperation. The Atlantic Council is a nonpartisan organization promotes U.S. leadership and engaging the world by partnering with allies to shape solutions to global challenges. Uh, take it away, Nico. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you to the Partnership for Global Security and the Nuclear Innovation Alliance for the invitation today. I'm really excited to participate as the Advanced Reactor Strategy Report is an impressive outcome to PGS's and NIA's outreach efforts. It was really difficult to decide on what to talk about in my introductory remarks. Judy and Ken did a great job highlighting the report, so I'll be brief as I look forward to the open discussion and Q&A after. The strategy report presents a holistic approach to the advanced nuclear ener energy industry. It is very comprehensive and looks at what it would take across the entire nuclear industry to make nuclear successful. The report builds off the momentum from last Congress, which started several significant programs. Now the challenge is we have to make them successful. I'm optimistic the new Congress, new administration, and new leadership at the Department of Energy will continue to support these programs and the nuclear industry. This report presents a framework for success. I wanna focus on two quick points. First of all, I highly recommend everyone on this webinar to read and digest the report. Due to the fact that it's so broad, there are gonna be areas that different organizations, many of which are on this webinar, will resonate with more. Second, I wanna emphasize that this report is more than just an academic exercise. Here's a few examples where NIA has previously provided significant value to ClearPath and others based on their in-depth technical report. These can provide the basis for collaboration or legislation. First report I um, wanna highlight is NIA published a report on enabling allied financing which is especially important to counter the state-owned enterprises that Ken mentioned in his remarks. They also released a report on streamlining the DOE's, the Department of Energy's Part 10 export process to tap into the global market and support international decarbonization. These are both topics and proposed pieces of legislation, such as the Senate's bipartisan American Nuclear Infrastructure Act. Another great report was on the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA. Um, we know we need to build um, as much and as quickly all the new clean energy resources, including nuclear. And recently we've seen that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission staff proposed a rulemaking that would incorporate some of these ideas into their environmental reviews, as well as there have also been recent pieces of legislation that include some of these ideas. This is another example where NIA has developed the technical basis for changes and organizations like mine can advocate for these changes that can accelerate clean energy deployment. Finally, the report I want to highlight um, from the NIA was on the SpaceX for nuclear. This report looked at applying the NASA COTS program to nuclear, and the report is now extremely relevant again. The Historic Energy Act of 2020 not only authorized the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program, but also DOE-wide the ability to implement a milestone-based development program. While this is authorized, DOE now needs to develop the guidance to carry out these programs successfully. If DOE is successful in this, it will better allow our innovators and entrepreneurs to partner with the DOE. It'll give them the opportunity to develop their designs, meet specific technical and hardware milestones, and de-risk the U.S. taxpayer unless a project shows promise and success. These are all historical reports. Again, they've been either incorporated into pieces of legislation or ongoing rulemakings or proposed rulemakings, I guess I should say, at the NRC, or have been picked up by industry and other organizations to champion for. I'm also aware of some of NIA's upcoming projects, which align with the strategy report, which will be really useful to prioritize NIA's work, but also other organizations to leverage the report. The international piece is also equally important. 
um, with the market that's available out there, as well as for the competition aspects that we have to be a leader, not just domestically, but also internationally. I'm really looking forward to continuing to work with NIA and PGS and others on this call to craft these solutions. So thank you for the invitation. And I look forward to our Q&A and open discussion later. And I will now turn it over to Dr. Jessica Lovering, the co-founder of the Good Energy Collective. Thanks, Nico. Uh, I'm gonna keep my comments short so we have lots of time for questions because I'm already seeing some good questions in there. Um, but just wanted to um, echo what Nico said. I'm, I'm really excited to see this um, report come out because I think, you know, at Good Energy Collective, we've been very excited about um, the, what Biden administration or what the campaign and now the administration has, has said about climate um, and also what they've said about nuclear in some of their documents um, and uh, early in the campaign. So we think this is a really critical time, particularly the next two years, um, while we know the Democrats have control of the Senate just barely, uh, kind of the time to get big action done. And I think something that's critical that comes across um, in this strategy that we also think is really important is, is how to integrate nuclear into a broader climate agenda. As Nico said, there's been some really great nuclear legislation in the last few years. Um, but to really move the needle to get big uh, movement on deploying advanced nuclear on demonstration, um, it's going to, need to be a big package, uh, big legislation with lots of funding, and that's probably going to be more likely to happen in a, in a broader climate change package uh, or legislation. Um, there's been a really good report that just came out um, from Evergreen Action on clean energy standards. And I think that's something that we need to keep our eye on because they're open to nuclear, but it's not very stressed in the report. Um, there's more talk about existing nuclear and how important that is, but um, going forward, they're looking at big expansion of clean energy and um, you know, they don't really have a plan for how nuclear is incorporated into that, although I definitely think a clean energy standard could be very beneficial to new nuclear. So that's just something to keep on our radar. I think, you know, it's been great working with NIA. Um, I worked with PGS in the past on, on different projects and other capacities and, and working with Clear Path at Good Energy Collective. So I think we've got a good group here to collaborate on fleshing out this agenda and, and getting good things done in the next two years. Thank you so much, um, Nico and Jessica. And thank you also to the Partnership for, for Global Security and for the Nuclear Innovation Alliance um, for inviting me to speak um, and to participate with such an incredible group. And congratulations also on the release of this extremely important report. Um, I wanna, as the last person um, to speak um, amongst the speakers, I wanna just kind of highlight quickly some of my takeaways from the report, but also from what each of you have said, um, and then very quickly wrap it up um, and turn it over to the Q&A. So first of all, Ken, um, I just thought that that was such an excellent explanation of what the stakes really are um, in this debate and why we should all pay attention and care about the United States having a strong civil nuclear export program. Um, Judy, also just an outstanding overview of what this new administration can do um, and how to address you know, the changes that we can make um, in working you know, from our roles in, in civil society um, and with NGOs to kind of to, to, to inform what the policies will look like um, in the next few years. And Nico, as always, it's great to listen to you talk um, about the regulatory environment and NRC rulemaking. And Jessica, I absolutely agree um, with your analysis that nuclear energy truly has a key role to play um, in a broader climate policy. So with that said, I do want to circle back, you know, from the Atlantic Council standpoint and the work that we do, I want to circle back to Ken's point about geopolitical competition and also geopolitical cooperation. Um, and say that one of the key, or a few of the key takeaways really for me in this report is the United States has a nuclear energy industry and we are competing against state-owned enterprises, especially in Russia and China. And so we understand that we are not going to nationalize our own nuclear energy industry, but I do believe that there is so much that we can do up until that point um, where we can truly empower 
nuclear energy and, a, and again, a strong civil nuclear export program um, to really make a difference and to, to, to be um, a counterweight, especially if we work with our allies, to be a counterweight to what Russia and China are doing. And so to pick up on a few specific things um, from the report, the 10 CFR Part 810 regulations and modernizing um, on that issue, um, proactively and preemptively negotiating Section 123 agreements um, with new to nuclear countries, and lifting the Atomic Energy Act um, FOCD provision where appropriate, um, you know, and certainly for US allies. Um, and just again, you know, minimizing trade barriers. And these are all things that are in the report, but minimizing trade barriers and looking to our allies, especially to see how can we cooperate? How can we provide that counterweight, especially when it comes to financing um, so that we can, again, become more than just the sum of our parts. So thank you again, and back to you, Dean. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I would uh, like to throw out a, a reminder, I guess, to the folks at this participating. So go ahead and send in questions. We've gotten some pretty good ones already. Uh, also, if you uh, haven't seen the report, I invite you to go on nuclearinnovationalliance.org. The, the report is posted there now. So if you want to look at it maybe later after the, the discussion or look at it while we're talking. Uh, what my first question is from a participant, and Judy, I'd ask you to comment on this first if possible. Uh, inclusion of, of nuclear into the clean energy framework heavily depends on the cost. Are there any ideas on how to encourage support, development, and commercialization of cost-effective nuclear power technology? And then any, any of, uh, of you, Nico, um, Jessica, and Jennifer, if you want to jump in after Judy, that would be great too. Judy? Yeah, so we need a big R&D effort, and we also need a demonstration effort, and we also need a commercialization effort. And Sometimes we think of that completely linearly, like first you do R&D, then you do demonstration, then you do deployment, and there's certainly some of that, but it also is a bit of a um, reinforcing circle that as we actually deploy technology, we learn, and then we actually can get better. So the, the process of bringing costs down is about doing the research and development and also the demonstrations and also the deployment. And we definitely need a strong role for government, but we also really need a strong role for the private sector. And it is really up to the private sector to make sure that we have a technology that's competitive and cost effective. But it's also really up to the government to make sure we have a robust R&D program, which goes after um, R&D that private sector can't uh, justify on its own, and also a partnership in the demonstration phase between the public and the private actors and then on deployment, there's a lot of role for industry, but there's also a lot of role for deployment policies, such as what Jessica mentioned in terms of a clean electricity standard or many other options, which would pull all clean technologies, including successful advanced nuclear, to the extent that the, we can make it successful into the economy and help us solve climate and other important energy problems. Nico, Jennifer, Jessica, any of, any of you would like to join in there? Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to, oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. Um, add a little uh, nuance to what Judy said. I think R&D, increasing R&D is really important, but also making sure that R&D is really targeted towards bringing costs down. Um, and so, you know, we've seen really good programs like DOE's um, Sunshot program, which had a specific cost target for solar panel, and they funded a lot of different projects to, to get there. Um, something that Biden mentioned in his um, campaign is developing an ARPA for climate, an ARPA-C. And one of the examples they gave of what it could fund would be a program that was aimed at bringing the cost of SMR down by 50%. So um, that's one of those targets that we'd love to see and actually funding to support that. And then on the on the demand pull side, I think that's maybe even more important. I think that's something that's really been lacking for nuclear. Um, on the policy side, um, you know, we've seen all sorts of different mechanisms for demand pull for renewables, um, which have really helped to spur the industry. And that brings costs down when you're building on a larger scale. So you know, it could be a clean energy standard, which increases demand for all sorts of clean energy, but it could be nuclear specific, like um, a program to build um, SMRs or micro reactors at federal facilities, um, something like that could help um, spur the first demand for the first, you know, several units to get going down that cost curve. 
Great. Anyone else want to chime in there? Yeah, I would just very quickly say, what's the cost of business as usual? And the cost of continuing down this path, um, you know, especially with fossil fuels. So, you know, yeah, I think, sure, there may be a cost, um, you know, especially in the R&D and kind of getting things spun up. But, um, you know, is, isn't, it, isn't that worth it um, if it's a way of mitigating human impacts on climate change? I also um, I wonder if we've got a couple questions um, on the international sort of front. So I think this is a good segue um, into uh, sort of the, the different kinds of uh, international agreement and, and international funding that might be brought to bear on this. Because uh, as we know, this is an area where the, according to the report, if, if the US is, is going to be sort of a, a lead developer in the technology, which in some cases it is, uh, international cooperation would help put this at, out, out there as a global solution, which is necessary for climate change. So we have a couple questions. One is um, from a reporter, Dan Yerman. I'm gonna combine these two. Uh, Ken, if you wanna take the first shot at this, should the US co cooperate with Western nations to create an international development bank? So now that we're getting it financing for nuclear en energy, this institutional arrangement could be an effective competitor to the favorable financial terms offered by Russian and Chinese state-owned enterprises, and if it's feasible. And then we have another question, is, is, it, is there an opportunity for allied countries to work together to drive the results we hope for? And here we're talking about any number of countries, Japan, UK, US, Canada, et cetera, uh, but even countries uh, in the rapidly developing world, such as India. So, that, that sort of international financing and cooperation, what's the, what's the, the role there, Ken? Um, let, me take the, let me take the second part first on, on, cooperation, with, um, on cooperation with allies. You know, the, there's, besides the United States, the, it's clear that the United Kingdom and Canada have a very clear interest in this advanced nuclear business. Um, South Korea and Japan also have an incredible technological capability in this area, but they're hindered at the moment by the politics of Fukushima. Uh, I, you know, to, I think that, again, you, 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 what you really need to be doing is what, what Judy and others have done, and that is back out from the technology into the larger framework. What are we trying to do? We're trying to decarbonize this global energy system so that we don't have to deal with the implications of climate change. So this is not the only technology, but it is definitely one in a suite of important technologies that can be applied. So one thing to think about is if Biden goes forward with this summit of democracies, which is supposed to have, you know, has its roots in the nuclear security summit process of Obama from 2010 to 2016. And I'm certain that there will be an energy component of that. You know, this nuclear issue should be part of that clean energy discussion among, among allies. I think it's important that allies work together. We've been locked, as some may know, in a kind of new kind of civil nuclear freeze out with the South Koreans over big reactors, but we can't, and it's impacted R&D, it's impacted the overall energy relationship. I just, you know, that kind of stuff can't interfere with this much larger global imperative, which is to, to, to try and decarbonize the global energy system. And if you look, you know, just the last two days I've seen, really long interview with Bill Gates in the Wall Street Journal and then another shorter version with Politico, uh, you know, he is, he, you know, to the point that, that Jessica and others are making, you know, this R&D issue is hugely important and the amount of money that we're spending on it doesn't, in his view, need to be trillions, but it does need to be about four times bigger than what we're currently spending. So I think that kind of R&D among allies is important. Second, we have to be able to overcome this competition among our friends. I, I mean, you know, from my perspective, I just don't think it's going to work. If the United States is fighting against South Korea and we're fighting against, you know, Japan or competing heavily with the Canadians or the UK, I just don't think that's going to work. I mean, the state-owned enterprise is not some kind of, you know, 
concept. It's a real thing where the government puts their money behind this geopolitical imperative. And that is extremely difficult to compete with because it's tied to the objective, the international objectives of the individual country. To the second part of that, which is the financing, I think Jennifer um, published something about six or eight months ago, which is really interesting on this question. I'm not expert enough in how the, the expert, fi ex expert export finance business works, but I certainly think we need a pool of money to, to Dan's question, some kind of bank. I don't know what the charter of that would be, but some pool of international money among the democratic countries is necessary because you know besides the climate issue the standards and the non-proliferation and security of these reactors going forward is an absolutely essential issue and we do not want to race to the bottom mm -hmm. nico would you like to join jump in there do you have anything to add if not we can go on to, to the next question um I wanted to throw out um, a question. There's a there's a pull a couple of threads together from um, some technical questions that folks are asking. I thought it'd be a good opportunity maybe to pull back for a moment and just talk about what we mean when we're talking about advanced energy technologies. There's some some questions about the general lack of support and perhaps even understanding of of molten salt fast reactors and sort of which I think goes to the heart of the public's imagination and understanding of what the, the rationale is for advanced nuclear when we pull away from sort of the traditional uh, larger reactor sets without getting into specific projects, uh, can one of you lay out, I'll, I'll just let someone volunteer for this one, sort of some examples of these technologies and why they offer advantages over sort of the traditional uh, nuclear power structure that we have today? I'll jump in. Um, sure, I, I think there's there's definitely been a lot of support for a lot of these different technologies. I mean, most recently with the Department of Energy's Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program, supporting everywhere from your single megawatt electric microreactors, all the way to all different kinds of coolants, um, advanced reactors, whether it's salt, liquid sodium, or gas. So there, there has really been a support from the Department of Energy to try to look at the variety of these technologies and see what makes sense to be the most cost competitive, as well as what different attributes they have to not just decarbonize electricity, but some of these advanced reactors at their higher temperatures can be really important for decarbonizing industry, either through directly using their process heat or producing hydrogen that can then be made into something that could be used elsewhere. So I think it's really looking at kind of the broader suite of recognizing we have a lot of different technologies. A lot of them have different advantages. How do we figure out which reactor types and designs can be that most comp cost competitive? But if we look even internationally, we see there is still an interest all the way from single digit microreactors all the way through thousand megawatt large light water reactors. So it's important for the US to have that capability to be competitive, not just domestically, but internationally with these different technology options. And that goes even that next step of what's the regulatory requirements to make sure they can review it and support all of these different designs that look different. They rely on safety different. They have different systems. So it's it's taking that holistic view. And that's where I think the report does a great job is it's not picking one technology or two technologies. It's saying we need a nuclear industry. What is it going to take us to get there here in the US as well as be um, a competitor and have a product or products to sell internationally? Um, as a follow up there, I, I wonder, Judy, if, if you could touch on why, you know, we're in this space coming out of um, a Senate energy package. I thought I just, um, someone brought this up earlier, but the thematically, at least we have, we're in a situation where it's very hard to get bipartisan support for climate solutions these days. And uh, at least, you know, for, for a lot of us who cover climate change, it seemed like there was there were some significant advances for advanced energy and, and other technological you know, solutions in that package. I wonder if you might just take a moment to talk to us about how uh, those that kind of consensus, does that bode well 
uh, going forward for this and other technology solutions when we have, even with you know, a democratically controlled Senate, we still are going to need um, a, a lot of back and forth between both parties to find common ground. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that, Judy? Yeah, I mean, the, the recent history of um, innovation legislation in general, and particularly for advanced, advanced nuclear is actually very, um, you know, upbeat. It's, you know, sometimes we're all looking <laughs> desperately for good news. And I think that that is good news. I think there's a broad support, bipartisan support for innovation broadly and for advanced nuclear in particular. And I think that's a great set of pieces of legislation and activities in the administration to build on. So I actually think that this is a bright spot in, um, in our potential progress uh, going into the future. And I think that there is, you know, it just tells us that it is possible to make genuine progress. And that you know, makes me excited to be working in this space. Um, I did see earlier, I thought Jessica raised her hand. Did she want to chime in on the- No, please, no. Jessica. Oh, okay. You have your hand up. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to pose this question to, to uh, Jessica and, and Jennifer Gordon anyway. So um, that's, um, I wanted to talk about, there have been a couple of questions about cost curves in terms of like us getting to a place where you know we can spread this tech, uh, technology overseas, and there's also some questions about waste. And obviously, we, we talk about nuclear energy. You're, you're, everyone is aware of the challenges uh, for waste. So I wondered, at I guess I'll take those as two sides of the coin, which is how do how does the U.S. help lead in 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 an arena where it has to uh, help drive down the cost curve but also with an eye toward making sure that we're managing um, concerns about waste and also you know, our partners overseas, we wanna make sure that what's one of these questions is, is getting to is making sure that we're working with other countries to ensure that we're providing, helping them provide the, the safest technology possible as, as, it's, uh, as it comes online around the world. Uh, uh, Jennifer, would you like to take, the, take it first? Sure, I'll take the first part of this um, on on the cost curves and also you know on on cooperating I think more effectively again with our allies and to kind of to pick up on what Judy was saying about um, some of the progress that we've seen in the last few years something that hasn't come up yet in this conversation is both the reauthorization of the U.S. Export Import Bank and also the lifting last summer of the United States Development Finance Corporation's the DFCs restriction on nuclear energy finance projects. So I think that these are both two really great steps um, in the right direction. And this is the kind of thing that a lot of these types of papers over the last several years um, have called for over and over again. And so it was really encouraging um, to see both, you know, to see these two developments. Um, and so I think that that's something that we can use, you know, we can take that momentum. Um, and, and by the way, you know, both of those steps are what will allow the United States to then enter into these partnerships um, on co-financing with, for example, JBIC, um, you know, or, or other, other countries, um, EXIM, you know, equivalents. So, so we can do that and then make more competitive financing offers to third party countries. So the party, the, the countries um, that are interested in acquiring either entirely new um, nuclear technologies, they haven't had nuclear before, um, or they're interested in perhaps acquiring different types of nuclear um, technologies than they previously had had. So anyways, um, this is something that I really hope to see continue. That's good, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, I think just on the on the cost curve side, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about this, I'm not gonna keep hammering on it, but there's, there's several different um, components of bringing costs down. You know, there's demand, as we mentioned, there's R&D, and there's also a lot of policy. Um, and different policies are needed at different stages, um, whether it's demonstration or it's diffusion. Um, and so, you know, we keep talking about this whole of government approach, but it really is important to coordinate across agencies and also federal and state level um, to have a more of a holistic approach to, to deployment and bringing the cost down. On the international side, I think you know, something that's 
an, a useful framing is to remember that, um, you know, the U.S. and not just the U.S., but a lot of European countries are not so great at doing big infrastructure projects. Uh, you know, it's really challenging um, to, to manage such a big project. And that's really what's plagued nuclear in, in the recent past, um, particularly in the West. Um, but um, we, particularly the U.S., is very good at building um, factory produced products like airplanes, cars, um, and you know, consumer electronics. And that's something that um, if you talk to people in a lot of these countries, these nuclear newcomer countries that are interested in starting commercial nuclear programs, they still really respect the reputation of the US and they would love to partner with the US on nuclear. But right now, uh, you know, Russia, China, South Korea are offering them much better packages for big construction projects. And they have more faith that those countries can pull off a big construction project. But if the US is able to demonstrate uh, much smaller modular nuclear technologies, I think those will be a really valuable export product. But there needs to be um, some policy developments in parallel to make that process go smooth um, if you're going to be exporting a lot of small nuclear. It's a very different paradigm than how we've done, you know, safety, security, nonproliferation um, in the past. There could be some benefits, but it's a big um, question of how to make that work um, right, how to do it right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Judy, I have a question uh, sort of among the policies. When you look around in the landscape for, for the US, you're looking for something that can get at, can, can drive finance, but also um, work to basically ensure that the, the low carbon technologies that are, are available are become, become more and more competitive. It seems like the clean energy standard, and those of us who have written about that over the years, sort of fits really nicely in that paradigm, uh, in part because, you know, I know there are big trade-offs and on Capitol Hill, that is not an easy issue and won't be an easy issue to get done. But when you look at this in, in terms of comparison to a cap and trade bill that we had on the Hill 10 years ago or a carbon tax, it seems like it is a policy that is at least doable. How, how would that work? And I don't want to provide an overly positive um, um, uh, scene setter for that, you know, would it really help advance nuclear technologies? And do you think it works as a, uh, at that intersection of political realism as well as, as driving technology? Yeah, so we, we are broadly supportive of um, pretty much any policy that can uh, get us, make substantial progress on the climate problem. See, uh, clean energy standards are particularly interesting for a few reasons. One is that they draw on the experience we've had at the state level with renewable portfolio standards, more, um, which is a narrower example, but more and more states are now expanding and looking at clean energy standards, which is a broader version of that. So we actually have uh, experience from the the states which are laboratories of democracy where we actually have successful examples of this type of approach. There's also substantial interest in, in um, Congress and by the administration in clean electricity standard as a mechanism. So that's intriguing. And what a clean electricity standard would do is it would basically require electric utilities to meet a clean electricity requirement, but it would give those utilities the option to pick whatever set of technologies work for that utility, for that region, for that time in, in, the, um, in the future when, when we're working towards going down to zero emissions. So it's a technology neutral approach to getting to where we need to go. So it wouldn't, for sure um, mean that, that advanced nuclear would be the big winner, but it would allow advanced nuclear to compete with other zero carbon options and would pull advanced nuclear as well as other zero carbon op options into the marketplace and help us solve the climate problem. Well, thanks for that. I, um, and uh, Ken, I, I have a, um, a question for you. It's being um, posed by, Someone who's watching this is, is, is asking about some articles that have been written recently, including in the Financial Times today, uh, about China restricting export of rare earth elements. 
uh, in that case, the four US defense objectives. And the question is, how does this sort of action give you pause when you start thinking about nuclear leadership, government influence? And I might add, you know, the, the concern about our access to, to rare, rare earth minerals is something in elements is something we hear a lot about on Capitol Hill, but it's hard to get uh, traction perhaps for, for Congress to really turn its attention to. So could you talk a little bit about that, about the concern of, of, of actually having access, access to these materials? Yeah, the, you know, this is another dimension of the US-China uh, innovation and technology competition, which is ultimately going to be one of the defining features of the next decade plus. Um, those rare earth materials are, I mean, a Financial Times story today focused on DOD and weapon systems, but they're also essential for, um, for electric vehicles and for other, you know, use in other renewable technologies. So I think what COVID proved to everyone is that having supply chains that can be choked off is not a good idea. And I think that the United States would be well served, and I think they are, both from the previous administration and into this one, looking at how you can diversify the supply of rare earths because they're essential for these high technology systems. So, you know, I, I, one of the themes that runs through this report, and I think that's going to run through uh, a lot of how this process develops is the US-China technology competition. And basically that's what Biden was talking about after his um, discussion with Xi. And there's lots of technologies we're talking about, one of them here with advanced nuclear. Uh, but you know, the, to, get to the point that was made earlier in developing economy countries, you will lose influence. You've got a hundred year plus relationship on big reactors, on smaller reactors, it's not clear how long that relationship would be. Maybe it's somewhat less than that. But still, you know, when you're cooperating with a nation on the provision of their electricity to run their economy, to service their population, um, to support their nation, that's not an insignificant thing. I think we've seen examples of in internationally and domestically what happens when the grid fails. And so um, that it's a big issue and cooperating with those countries is a major challenge that the United States has to take on diplomatically. I think they've been thinking about it and trying to do it, but I think we really need to ramp that up aggressively. And the supply line issue uh, is no, no question has to be near the top of the agenda. Great, Ken. Uh, anyone else want to take a, a shot at, at, at that one? Yeah, I just wanted to add that this is one of the areas where we think there's opportunity for nuclear to get more integrated into the broader clean energy sort of community and discussion because um, critical minerals like rare earths are really important for renewables and also um, batteries, electric vehicles. And it's something where, you know, we've seen this push recently with the Nuclear Fuels Working Group, a push for more domestic mining for uranium. But there's also this focus in the Biden administration on environmental justice. Um, we're going to have a lot of questions around um, leasing on federal lands for mining. So I think there's room there for, for nuclear to work with renewables advocates to figure out what um, you know, sustainable mining looks like for a lot of these critical resources and also how to stimulate it domestically, make sure we don't have those supply chain choke points, but in a way that's really um, equitable and just. And I think that's kind of a you know, challenge opportunity that we're seeing maybe in the next few years. Hmm. Uh, one last question I, I'd like to, to pose to you all, and I guess I would probably throw this out to Nico first, and then uh, maybe if Judy would like to um, answer also, just a short question about grid reliability. This seems like a, an issue that, you know, the Trump administration talked about that, but its ideas about grid reliability may not have, um, you know, been, been necessarily greeted because they tended to involve um, fossil fuels. But I think it did raise an interesting question, which is, you know, are we well prepared on the issue of grid reliability with the energy mix we have? Could, could uh, Nico first, and then Judy, could you talk just shortly about, you know, what, what kinds of, why this technology and why we need to ensure grid reliability and why that matters? Yeah, I mean, I, definitely a, a very important topic. And I think where these new technologies um, are going to be important is 
first of all, we're gonna need all sorts of different clean energy technologies for different locations. So some, some areas of the country will be more suited for some for wind or solar, some will be more suited for nuclear. So there, there's gonna be a lot of different energy resources that are necessary. And I think that that is the most important thing. And then kind of that next step with these new technologies is they are trying to build in a lot more of that flexible operation. So being able to use them for process heat, um, thermal energy storage, which can provide kind of that long duration energy storage. Um, one of the advanced reactor companies that was selected by the Department of Energy is currently looking at this. So I think that's really where these designs are gonna have that flexibility is how can they be used differently by the grid to ensure not just reliable electricity, but also clean electricity? Hmm. Judy, go ahead. Yeah, I would just say that, you know, we have to do both. We have to both look at these individual technologies and help them advance their performance in partnership with industry and make sure that we actually have technologies that work. But we also have to constantly remember that it's part of this system. And the electricity system in particular is a very important system and, and basically is a machine itself in a way. And having all of the components work well, but also interact well, and making sure that we have system resources, which involves things like energy storage. It also involves having a diversity of different types of supply options, which gives you more resilience. But it's really you know, making sure that we both keep looking and working on the individual components of the system, but also never forget how important it is that the system as a whole work because it's so important to keep the lights on and it's so important to decarbonize. And we just absolutely have to make sure that we're keeping our eyes on, I'm afraid, multiple balls at the same time. Thank you, Judy. Uh, I just would like to remind everyone if, uh, if you have further questions, you'd like to get a hold of some of these folks um, through Ben, you can email Ben at, at uh, Bensonville, at, at Ben at renewpr.com. If, if he can put you in charge of, uh, uh, put you in, in touch with folks or make sure that you can get the report um, and, make, and make sure you can see it. And uh, I just wanted to thank everybody for participating. We had a great, uh, great turnout today and some pretty impressive people on this panel. Uh, I really enjoy the subject. I'd like to thank uh, Judy and Ken and Nico, Jessica and Jennifer and everybody uh, over at uh, Ben's shop for putting this together. And uh, thanks everybody for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Dean. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.